Uh, we are delighted to share the stage with the International Space Elevator Consortium, who has so graciously supported the curation of a lot of the content this month, especially Dr. Peter Swan. Thank you. We're honored by your expertise on this month's schedule. So we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and we plan to have a lot of fun. And um, hopefully it'll be smooth sailing from here on out. So um, please feel free to drop, drop questions and comments in the chat. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and thank you for joining. And I now pass it on to Tim Chrisman, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Foundation for the Future. Thanks, Lila. Um, I'll be I'll be quick because if there's one thing I cannot take from Pete Swan, it is five more of his minutes. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the, the short version of my intro is the Foundation for the Future started around the idea that America stopped doing aspirational and inspirational infrastructure projects. Uh, and we settled for filling potholes. And so it's exciting to be partnered with ISEC for the most inspirational and aspirational infrastructure project that humanity has yet attempted. I think that is about as quick as I can go, Pete. So <laughs> I yield the balance of my time. I'm Leo Yanos. I'm design manager here for Foundation for the Future. So I'm super excited co-hosting this event with my co-host, Lee, which will be joining me later this afternoon. Um, but for now, we are going to be presenting Dr. Peter Swan. I'm going to give a brief intro for Dr. Swan. Dr. Swan is actually the president of ISEC and team lead for developing the concept of space elevators. A member of International Academy of Astronautics and fellow of AIAA and TBIS, he graduated from the USMA in 1968 and served 20 years in the Air Force. He joined the Iridium Satellite Program, then teaching science and technology, teaching space systems engineering. He continues to teach at Arizona State University for the OLLI classes, and his latest book is Road to the Space Elevator Era. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Dr. Peter Swan. Welcome, everybody. The International Space Elevator Consortium is pleased to be co-sponsoring this event on space-elevators with, of course, the Foundation of the Future and the Blue Marble Week. We have a professional team of players who have been there and done that. An example, I have 50-plus years within the space arena and I have been at the beginning of two successful major projects. I have tested, broken, fixed, launched, and operated satellite systems. Now I am a passionate about and lead a team that will build a permanent space infrastructure. Now today's mission is twofold. One is to announce that space elevators are transitioning into the engineering test and validation phase. This is a huge first step. We are moving into development. The second uh, aspect of this day is we want to inform about why do we need a permanent access to space? How do we reach our goal? And where are we in the development of space elevators? So we have some goals for the day and some needs that we have to express. Today's speakers are remarkable in two aspects. One, they have significantly navigated their professional lives with great achievements, building necessary expertise and knowledge. And then they've now committed towards the development of a remarkable concept that will improve the human condition, no less than improve the human condition. As we go forward today, I'd like you to think about a few things. Just take some notes as you go along. But here are some that I see. First, space elevators can be built. Second is space elevators are necessary. In fact, essential. The word essential now has new meanings, of course. Essential to fulfill our visions. Space elevators should be in parallel development with advanced rockets. They should be compatible and complementary to SpaceX, Blue Origin, NASA, 
uh, European Space Agency, China, and Russia. We should be parallel with those activities, not competitive. Space elevators are indeed the green road to space, which will enable Earth-friendly missions. We're going to have two uh, presentations on that particular aspect. Green road to space, improving the human condition. And we desire to be, our objective is to be the second lane on the road to space. Okay, let's get going on a few charts here. The first is space elevators are evolutionary. It's a big step to get off the planet. And we're going to help everybody take that first big step. So we're evolutionary in the human history. We're now going to space in a big way. But we're also revolutionary. We're going to change the equation of delivery, the dynamics of massive tonnage versus the limiting of rocket equation. This change liberates movement of logistics cargo by electricity, no burning of rocket fuel. And we're going to fulfill the uh, customer's needs. Now, just to put it in perspective, the human race has lifted off 22,000 pounds to orbit. 22,000. What we're claiming in our first year of limited operations would be about 30,000 tons to space uh, to orbit. Now, that's 30,000 versus 22,000 in 63 years. Now, we say that if we go to our full operational capability, we'd be launching 173,000 tons per year to geosynchronous and beyond. That's five times what the humans have done in their whole career to space. But first, we have to figure out where we're going and how to get there. And the strategy is we want to combine with rockets. Rockets have tremendous strengths. We have tremendous strength. So the strategy is dual space access architecture. Now, I want you to notice the little chart, a uh, picture on the right. We had an intern doing some research as a, you know, third year college student. And she was looking at geosynchronous satellites. And now she comes up with an art, a picture that deploys, that shows, describes elevators living with rockets in a complementary activity. So now, where are we? Space elevators are going to jump from where we've been, which is assessing the technologies across the different segments, to one where we have to start testing these different segments. We really need to step up and say, okay, let's test the technologies and show that they can be used in our segments so we can actually go build a space elevator. We're ready to prove that we can build the space elevator. Now, this book is in the uh, on our website. The website's right there. We just put it on there on Saturday. Uh, we finished it up. It's about 80 to 100 pages long, and it has the engineering uh, background to make the claim that we're going to start engineering development today. Go and read it. We've got eight pages on how to operate safely in the environment. We have eight pages that says how we can operate in the environment of space debris. We explain how we have alternatives and we could do different aspects in the design. It really is a comprehensive 20 year of data document. Here's some uh, studies that led to the previous document. Isaac has done 12 and we've got two in the dock right now. The first one is beneficial environmental impacts of space elevators. We call it the green road to space. Now, there's two aspects to that. One is that we go through the altitude change with electricity, solar power to energy to climb, no burning of rocket fuel. The second is we move massive amounts of uh, cargo to geosynchronous, and we can enable some very important missions that will stop global warming. Well, that was an advertisement by Dr. Uh, uh, Mankins, and he truly believes that he can significantly impact global warming. So we can enable his program. The other one is the design of the technical aspects of the tether climber. The study so far has shown that we can do uh, tether climbing in an engineering sense, friction of the material, climber pressure, things like that. Those two are ongoing. 
We also have two massive studies that were done by the International Academy of Astronautics. Their, clue, their conclusions were space elevators are feasible. And then the second one shows the road to space. They called it the road to the uh, space elevator era. So they're going. And then the Obayashi Corporation did a massive study in 2013. And they came up with a sta statement that they could build a massive space elevator by 2050 with, with, obviously, we have little issues here and there, but we can do it. Okay, what are we going to do today and the rest of the uh, talks? got some really good talks. We've got two talks talking about the green road to space. We've got two talks by Mr. Fitzgerald, who's going to talk about where we are in the engineering development and what do we have to do next. We have some economic looks. We've got uh, past studies look and where we are in the research arena. And we've got a full hour on the material that's going to make up our tether. So we have some very good discussions there. Then we have a summary of research. And then we have a panel that should be fun. But we also have Vern Hall, who is our harbor master. And he'll talk about how this vertical dimension is now being added to the human history of transportation. So we've got some really neat concepts coming up. But first, let's talk about vision. Mr. Bezos says he wants to have millions of people in space but he also wants to initially set up the road to space for the next generation. Mr. Musk says, we are going to be multiplanetary. NASA says we're going to the moon pretty soon, and we're going to put women and men on the moon. And then, of course, the National Space Society for 50 years has said, we really got to get off Earth and start having humans working in uh, thriving communities. The space elevator vision is simple. We want to raise mass with electricity. So we become the green road to space and we want to move a lot of mass so we can able, enable other people's visions. We want to become the second lane to space. Okay, what do we have going on for us? If we put up this in the near future, then America will have leadership in space for decades. If somebody else puts it up, there's going to be leadership from other countries. Now, we know that China has announced they're going to have a space elevator by 2045. The Japanese have been looking at it seriously. Uh, India would really like to have that leadership in space. So we have a lot of people looking at how do we get to space and really have a, a national leadership there. Of course, you put up an infrastructure as jobs, jobs, jobs. Think of putting a bridge up, Golden Gate Bridge, latest one from Malmo, Sweden, Sweden to Copenhagen. Those bridges are infrastructure, and that's what we're talking about. The basic message is Earth space elevator will move freight on an infrastructure, not on individual events. The strategy is we're going to go up together. We're going to use the strengths of space elevators. We're going to use the strengths of rockets. We're going to have a real good, strong combination there. So what's it called? It's called dual space access architecture. Rockets are extremely good at getting to low Earth orbit, going to any inclination, depositing their payloads. And now we've got reusability, so they're coming back down. Tremendous strengths. Rockets have get through the radiation belt rapidly for people. Space elevators, if you think of a bridge and a permanent infrastructure, that's what it is. Safe, daily, routine. Uh, environmentally friendly, inexpensive. You just go across the bridge. So the real kicker is a combination of the two is a winner. We want to support all the Space X and, and uh, Blue Origin and NASA, European Space Agency, China, Russia. We want to approve and support their growth in rockets. But we want to go along with them on the road to space. Our vision, we're looking at Two space elevators together in what we call a galactic harbor. Well, why would we put two together? Well, if somebody's going to invest enough in one, they'd probably want to have one right next to it to back it up. We don't ever want to be caught by gravity again, so two of them together. So we would have three galactic harbors. Now, why do three? three? Well, we just found that number is a good number. We figure whoever puts it up first, there's going to be competition. Somebody's going to come up second. And oh, by the way, it's going to make a lot of money. It's going to move a lot of mass, so there's going to be a third one. 
There could be four, five, six, seven galactic harbors. There's no real limit there. Depends on the needs. What are the customer demands? Well, we've looked at our design. We essentially feel that the initial operating capability is 20 metric ton tethers. And that came about from the strength of the materials. So what we do is we just work from there and we have 20 ton uh, climbers. We have seven of those on the tether at any one time. So it's basically 14 metric tons of payload to geosynchronous and beyond per week or per day they're on there. But we're going to daily lift off 14 metric tons. Well, if you do six times that, you end up with 30,000 metric tons of cargo going up per year in the first year of real operations. Well, that's a lot. 173,000 is a lot too. And that's what we see when we have fully operating uh, architecture. Here's the number just to give a little history of the amount of mass we moved to, uh, to orbit by the humans. You know, the biggest number there is the space shuttle. Now I counted the space shuttle as a satellite because that's what it is. Now it used a lot of mass to get it up there, rocket fuel, reusable uh, and, uh, and uh, throwaway rockets. So it is a satellite. So we counted that, that's the biggest number in there. The rest of the satellites are relatively small. And so we don't have big numbers on mass to orbit. Well, a space elevator enables mass to orbit. Why are we looking at this? Because the customer has come to us and said, we need mass to orbit. Space solar power. We're going to talk about that in two of our talks later on. I'm going to have one try then. They need 5 million tons to geosynchronous. Nuclear material disposal, we can get rid of nuclear waste. We can do a lot of things. If you're able to move mass, you can solve a lot of problems. Mars colony, Mr. Musk wants a million tons. L5 colony, oh, they got a lot. They want 11 million tons to have their colony in the at the L5 location. Okay, but let's put it in perspective. The customers are demanding thousands and hundreds of thousands of tons. Let's look at Apollo. We lifted off the Apollo 11. That's it on the left and it's, it's lift off. And we took that capsule and landed it on the moon. The apparatus that landed on the moon was one half of 1% of the mass on the pad. When that capsule landed in the surface of the ocean and was floating in the ocean, it was two tenths of a percent of the mass on the pad. So the delivery statistics are really lousy for rockets. They do not deliver a large amount of mass to their destination because of the rocket equation. And if you think it gets 4% to low Earth orbit, that's 4% of the mass of the pad, and then it gets 2% to geosynchronous or tossed to the Mars, and only half a percent to the surface of the moon or Mars, then you ask yourself, how can you afford to send pizza, you know, when you have 99.8% of the mass thrown away before you get to the surface of the moon? The delivery statistics are lousy. So if you look at actual numbers here for the different ones, I tossed in Starship and New Glenn, of course, those are estimates, but they're down there in the low numbers. The delivery of mass, the destination by rockets, is really questionable. So it's really worrisome. So that's what we talk about as a conundrum of rockets. Delivery to target, delivery to customer. The space elevator has 20 tons on the surface of the ocean. It takes that 20 tons all the way to geosynchronous. Now, 14 is payload, so you can count that as delivery. So you can do 70% of the mass at the surface of the ocean, lifted all the way to geosynchronous and beyond. And then that other 30% is reused. So we really don't throw away anything. It's a hundred percent delivery to the geosynchronous and beyond, but the payload goes to where the customer wants it. That's 70%. The numbers for rockets are poor. Now, we all understand that the future rockets are gonna to be totally reusable. And that's excellent. That will save you on money. You can reuse them. You can launch them often. 
They are really great uh, advances. And we support rockets 100% because we want to go with rockets. We want to have a dual space access architecture. Rockets do wonderful things, but they don't deliver mass in large numbers where you need them. So that's the real issue. We want to supplement rockets. Okay, basic messages that are coming along. Green road to space with massive movement. Okay, we're ready to initiate the space elevator development program today. Our strategy is to propose dual space access architecture and go with the rocket. Our vision is we want to match our vision with your vision so that we can help you fulfill your dreams of a colony out there or mining on the moon or research in, uh, in outer planets, whatever. We want to be there with your vision. And then we've got to escape the conundrum of rockets for everything. Rockets are very, very good. We've got to do that. But they don't, they should not be moving the mass of our future. So the promise of space elevators is so remarkable, we really cannot wait. We need to jump out and do that. I'm not going to go over this, but you can look at it later when you peruse the charts. The bottom line is space elevators are like a bridge to space. Golden Gate Bridge, or maybe the bridge from Malmo, Sweden to Copenhagen. Remarkable. They are routine, daily, inexpensive, safe, uh, move massive amounts of cargo. It's remarkable. And that's what we're going to do with the space elevator. Provide the road to space. Second lane, of course. Now, we had a research at Arizona State University and the International Space Elevator Consortium had a combined re uh, study, and we came up with all kinds of remarkable things. We had some students do some neat calculations, but the bottom line is we changed the equation to go to Mars. We changed the concept. An example, today, we just landed three, I mean, we went into orbit around the uh, Mars or landed three countries programs recently. It took them seven and a half to eight months to get there. And they can only launch every 26 months. Well, with space elevators going around the earth and tossing payloads at 7.76 kilometers per second off of the apex anchor, we can do it every day. We can launch every day. Now the fastest time is 61 days to get there, but you can launch on Tuesday and it'll take you 400 days. On Wednesday from the Atlantic uh, Space Elevator, it takes 79 days. On Thursday, you launch from the, uh, the uh, Asian uh, Space Elevator, oh, it'll take uh, 180 days. So the bus schedule that's developed is remarkable. So you not only can launch every day, but you can get there in a variety of times, depending on the alignments of the planets, of course. And then there's the critical issue of mass. Rockets get about a half a percent, maybe 1% to Mars. And that's being very, very gracious. Go do the numbers. What we can do is we can get 70% of the mass on the pad all the way to the surface of the uh, Mars. Of course, we have to use rockets at the other end. We've got to use something to slow them down. So rockets are very, very good. We love rockets. We want to go with rockets. Okay. So we look at this little image, and it kind of emphasizes that the Arizona State University research shows we can get there in 61 days, release every day, in massive cargo. So let's look at three reference missions just to give you a feel for what the customer really wants. The customer wants... 5 million tons to geo. We're going to have two talks on this. The uh, moon village wants like a half a million tons to the moon. Now remember, half a percent delivered to the surface of the moon. So that's a factor, what is that? Factor of 500, right? No, 200, 200. So the mass on the pad has to be 200 times that. Bummer. SpaceX colony, a million metric tons. We want to help Mr. Musk there. We believe in his vision. We want to go with him to Mars. Okay, solar power satellites. What I'm going to do, this is going to be talked about twice more because it's very, very important, the green road space aspect. But I want to show you how the dual space access architecture works.
The green line in the middle is Dr. Mankin's request that he wants to fulfill, providing enough energy to stop or slow down global warming. That's the amount of electricity delivered from geosynchrony. The bottom line looks like a steady growth of delivery of mass to geosynchronous. That's done by rockets, but it's steady. Now, just to give you a feel for it, that line is essentially a thousand launches a year of 20 metric tons to geo. Just to give you a feel, thousand launches a year. We don't even do a hundred normally per year across the globe. And we want to do a thousand to support Mr. Mankins. Okay. Well, space elevators are not going to be ready for, let's say, 12 to 14 years or so. So we're not going to be providing too much at the beginning. But as we ramp up, we get to 173,000 tons per year. That would mean we could fulfill Mr. Mankin's need in five years once we get going. So the idea is we move mass, rockets move critical stuff. And it, as an example on this thing, rockets must put the prototype vehicles up so that we can have the prototypes show what's going on. And then when we get ready to produce the actual vehicles to provide solar power, then we would be there in time to start moving the big mass. These are extraordinary numbers when you look at what Mr. Musk wants. 40,000 launches to get to his number of five or one million tons to the surface of Mars. Okay, the near future. We believe we can provide movement of mass to geosynchronous and beyond to become the transportation story of the 21st century. This is where we're at. We are ready to start engineering testing of space elevators. Okay, I think we have one question. Uh, Dr. Eddie, are you there? You want to hit your mic on? Ask a question? Sure, Peter. What is it going to take to start this engineering validation? Well, that's a very good question. What do we need to start this? Well, I'll tell you, it's already started. We've got one group looking at the first stage, so how we help beat the the uh, atmosphere and then put up a little first stage type instead of launch from the surface. We have an earth port team that are looking at what do we need to do for operations? How many computers do you have to have in the middle of the Pacific? You know, all that kind of stuff. Operational look at how we do that. We have uh, development of the simulation. We, we want to come up with a gold simulation that shows the dynamics of the space elevator so we can predict the, uh, GPS location, X, Y, Z, of every element in a space elevator. And you can pick your size of element, one meter, you know, 60 meters, uh, 60 kilometers, one kilometer. But we could predict where all those spots are in a ge geocentric type uh, stuff. So we've started. So we're already ongoing. But the question is, what's next? And the next is we have to build up some testing of you know, initial testing of stuff like the material. We need to produce some of the material that's going to be used and test it in a small stuff. We jokingly say we'd like to have a footbridge made out of the material we're going to use in space. It sounds to show it. It sounds to me like you need an institute, a research institute of some sort. And also, we're talking very seriously about coming up with a space elevator institute that would address all these issues in an academic and developmental sense. So yes, we need one of those also. There are many, many parallel efforts going on so that we can jump into that engineering validation box there. And we can see that it, it has already started. The question is, what's next? Who's going to do which part? And so that's, that's where we're at. And it really is exciting. And so I just want to thank you for the opportunity, and I want to thank Foundations for the Future for their opportunity to let us have a day on Earth space elevators. Now, tomorrow and the next day, we're going to talk about different aspects of it, and we're going to have the lunar elevator on, on Thursday. So this is really an exciting three days, and I really appreciate the opportunity from the Foundation of the Future. And I hope you look for 
these videos uh, in the near future and go to our website and try to keep up with what's going on. There's a lot going on in space elevators, and I welcome you to the team. Our newsletter goes out each month, and it tries to keep everybody up. You can go to our website and sign up just for the newsletter. You don't have to join us or anything else. Of course, if you join us, that'd be good, but you can uh, just keep track. So that's where we're at. I really appreciate everything that's been done. And um, I'll be seeing you around the, uh, the elevator, so to speak. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Well, I hope so. Okay, Peter. Um, thanks for the presentation. And um, I'm going to preface this by um, asking about a couple of assumptions that you made. Uh, the first was that you're looking to do 30,000 to 173,000 tons a year in your proposals. Is that the order of magnitude? Right? Okay. Yep. So, so, you know, what you had said was that this is beyond Elon's uh, envisioning, and we've been skirting around the Starship discussion. And I'd point out that 173,000 tons is only 1,730 Starship flights. No, 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 no. You got to... You got to make sure you understand what the numbers mean. If they want to send a hundred metric tons to Mars, okay, which is what they want to do, along with a hundred people, they have to launch five times. No, that that's not what I'm saying. I'm I'm talking about strictly for the idea of putting uh, payload into Leo. So right. If okay. So you get into Leo. Okay. So then you know it costs you. Uh, a, a factor of four to go from Leo to Mars. Understood. I don't even want to talk about going to Mars. It's out, outside of scope. Oh, but okay. If, well, if I don't want to talk about Leo. We don't go to Leo. Well, doesn't the space elevator go to orbit for the sake of this? No. Right? Earth orbit. Discuss what we're talking about. Space elevators are perfect for geo and beyond. Right. We can, so, go, we can go to Leo, but it would have to be really in... Uh, in equatorial orbit. Most missions in LEO are high inclination, so we really don't want to go there. Okay, well, it, it kind of comes to the second question that I had, where you're talking about the rocket equation, and yes. I, would, I would suggest that um, that might be the wrong question. It's one that we all focus on, and I understand the rationale of all of that, but if I look at the Starship and basically just say it's a magic device that puts 100 tons in orbit, I abstract all of the, the fuel propellants and all of that that comes from the rocket equation. Then the question from a pure, not from an energy perspective, like you're discussing with the rocket equation, but from um, an economic perspective, the question becomes, what will um, the Starship charge to put that 100 tons into orbit on a per kilogram basis? To make it free, I don't care. Well, that's actually what we're intending to do. So this is one of the reasons why I'm here is that I'm trying to put forth a proposal that we will offer free starships to Leo. Sure, fine. Okay, we agree. Okay. I have no desire so, to compete with Mr. Musk. Mr. Musk has a delightful program. I love his activities. I encourage him greatly. He's doing a fantastic job. His strength is getting stuff to Leo and having all reusability. I don't right. argue that at all. Let it be free. It's fine with me. Okay, good to hear. And then part of the reason why I'm here is, like you, I've gone through the space elevator discussions, and they're almost invariably driven on the idea that it lowers the cost of getting you know, out of the gravity well. That's correct. And it was that, that was the thrust of it until about 2015. We don't care so about cost anymore. What's the primary benefit of space elevators then if... It opens up yeah. missions that you can't do with space uh, rockets. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're literally not targeting the area of us being able to put lots of payload into orbit. Into low That's Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit. And, you know, I'll start arguing with you if you want to go to GEO. We can do it cheaper to GEO even if you're free. Okay, there's a lot of other costs like uh, environmental impact, uh, things like that, that rockets are kind of like not very good at.
But, uh, okay. you know, we can go from there. But, uh, you know, I'll just concede. If you want to do it free, it's fine with me. No, I mean, my underlying mission in the market that we're looking at is, to be honest, um, doing the O'Neill cylinder conversation. Oh, right? don't even bring that up. Don't even well, bring that up. You cannot more, supply 11 million tons to L5. Um, or, okay, I'll rephrase it. I have a project right now, Voyager Station, that's looking at going up by 2027. And they're doing all kinds of robotic assembly, all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to make the business case that we can do it in 100 ton chunks. For, and, fine, uh, go ahead. I agree. I, I'll support you. Okay, but it's in so, Leo. It's in Leo. Mm -hmm. Right. It, okay. And I support completely. You want to do that in Leo? I think Mr. Musk is doing a marvelous job. He's really remarkable. Uh, he's got great vision and, oh, by the way, knows how to do his vision, which is really remarkable. And he's doing a great job. I concede, you know, let's let's support rockets to go into the orbits that are hard for space elevators. I think that's great. We're going to switch gears over to Bill Britton. He had a question. Oh, good. Uh, thanks, yeah. Chris. Peter, great presentation. I guess the question is um, that's on a lot of people's mind is, why now? What, what makes it now that we can get to this point, that we can do this engineering analysis? Um, what, what is it that really turned the corner that got us to this point that we can really start talking about it now? Well, I'm going to let Michael Fitzgerald talk about that in his two talks. But essentially, we've done all the preliminary technological readiness assessments on all the things, plus the space elevator tether is now doable. Uh, we have Adrian Nixon talking for what did I give you? 45 minutes today on the material that uh, will be our tether. Now, I want to make sure we understand what Adrian's going to be talking about is two dimensional materials, and we'll focus on single crystal graphene. But there are about a thousand, he told me the other day, there are about a thousand materials that are starting to surface that have the same types of characteristics. So we've had a whole new arena of material science surface and it's just remarkable and it, it can now i'm going to stand up and say it can be our tether uh, uh adrian is probably going to say something like we'll have tether material by the time we need it or something like that but the thing that changed was uh the international academy of astronautic studies that said the technologies are there and the two-dimensional material 2d material that surfaced in uh the laboratories across the world and that's that those are the two big things that have happened perfect thank you awesome oh, one, one other thing let me toss one other thing the other thing is the globe humanity started dreaming again about going off planet that's a huge driver i mean that was really dormant for so many years. And that's really turned around. The National Space Society has really helped on that. Mr. Musk has his vision. Mr. Bezos has his vision. Uh, you know, uh, we have tremendous hope surfacing across the globe. And that's a third factor that I think is really important. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Swan. I think we actually moved up to 10 o'clock on the dot. Right. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Swan. Great space elevator is actually a huge job, but as all space infrastructure, we can very much make it happen. Um, and these are the conversations that we need to be having. So from Foundation for the Future and Blue Marble Week, thank you so much to Dr. Swan and Isaac. For more information, please visit f4f.space and isec.org.